Ma'am, uh, will someone be doing the recap today? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we will start sharp at nine o'clock. Okay, sharp. Sure, sure.
Anand sir, we'll begin uh, with the recap. Sure, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Uh, children, uh, uh, we'll have uh, Shivraj give the recap for today as well. Shivraj, are you there? Shivraj, you are on mute. Okay, you are not able to unmute. One minute, please. Uh, Intiasa, can you allow children to unmute themselves? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Done, ma'am. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Shivraj. You can begin. Good morning. Uh, so last week we went through. Uh, we started with uh, conditional probability, and uh, after we 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 took uh, sir gave us a few examples on uh, conditional probability, and uh, we understood uh, it more intuitively. And then we uh, looked at uh, how disjoint, how disjoint and independent are both different terms, and uh, not, and uh, they cannot be used interchangeably. And then after that, we looked at uh, Newton Pepe's problem, and uh, and after and we even discussed about how uh, like how like how Newton gave uh, uh, proof for um, for the uh, uh, like uh, for the for the, the problem and uh, how, how he was uh, he was right with the answer, but the way he gave the proof wasn't right. And then we looked at how many conditions need to be satisfied to attain independence. Um, and uh, also we uh, looked at uh, the interpretation for uh, P of, uh, I mean, conditional probability, uh, A given B. So if A and B are two events, then what is, then we looked at how, how to interpret probability of A given B. And then we also looked, uh, before that, uh, Sir taught us a uh, different approach called a frequentist approach, uh, which was uh, simpler, uh, in, in, intuitively it made more sense. Uh, but might not always uh, be right if you want to give a proper mathematical proof. And uh, we also looked at uh, proof for P of A intersection B, uh, which was a base formula. Uh, and, uh, and then after that, we generalized it to intersection of multiple events. And uh, yeah, uh, so which would, these were the things we covered in the last class. So. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, I think almost everything has been recapped. And that way we can uh, start today's class with just stating what uh, Shivraj said. So one important thing that will be uh, coming up again and again is the law of uh, total probability. So I'll just uh, call it LOTP. And uh, this is just, I mean, the name is not really important. So let's say you have an event B and uh, you have uh, it's sitting in the sample space somewhere in a weird fashion. You split the sample space into A1, A2, and A3 here. So you have a partition here. And when you have this, what you can do to split the event B into smaller events is uh, as follows. So you can do this. And uh, this, as we know, can be written as pre probability of P given A1 times probability of A1, and so on. So this is uh, the law of uh, total probability. And also, uh, another thing that we will see is the Bayes rule coming up again and again. Okay. So the Bayes rule is just a way to connect probability of A given B in terms of uh, probability of B given A. So this will be best rule. And uh, probability of B can be split based on uh, A as well. I mean, by using LOT. All right. <laughs> so, uh, we said that uh, conditional probability is important because uh, it helps us update the posterior probabilities, the probabilities, probability of A given B, 
which means that B was produced to you as an evidence. And uh, with this new evidence, how do you update the existing probability of A? So that is probability of A given B. And uh, you can do this using conditional probability. And also by LOTP, you can uh, break a problem into sub problems and solve these sub problems, which might be easy and then combine it together. All right. So to understand conditional probability better. So let's see uh, another example. Okay. So this example uh, is uh, with two cards randomly picked from a deck. So get two cards randomly from a deck. Okay. And the question is find the probability that uh, both the cards drawn are aces. And uh, you also know the fact that one of these cards is an ace or like we have an ace. So we might have two cards which are ace or we might have just one ace, but we have an ace. Okay, this is the first uh, question. And uh, we have, we want to understand how this is uh, different or same from uh, this. So here we are saying that we have a specific uh, ace, which is the ace of spades. Would there be a different difference in these probabilities? That's what we want to understand. All right. So as we know, we can write probability of A given B as uh, by the definition as probability of A intersection B by probability of B. According to that, we can write uh, the first one as uh, probability that we have both aces and we have an ace divided by the probability that we have an ace. Can someone tell me the expression for the numerator or a simplification of the numerator? So what is the probability that we have both aces and have an ace? What is this event same as? That's the hint. So based on today's uh, class response, I'm actually planning to conduct a test uh, if needed to understand how much you guys have understood. But uh, I mean, if you guys are responding well, then I'll just go ahead with the class. But otherwise, uh, I'm planning to actually do a Google Classroom uh, exam, which will have tougher questions. So. Yeah, the response matters. Can someone tell me what uh, the first, uh, the numerator would be? Okay. So, exactly. So, uh, the answer is right. And another way to um, actually see this is to just say that uh, you have four aces and out of which you can pick two. And there are four choose two ways of doing this. And the denominator would be the number of ways you can pick two cards from a full deck. So that is this. So when you reduce that, uh, you get the same expression as uh, this all right okay and uh, what would be the denominator okay. 
okay the denominator would be one minus something so what is the event that i'm looking at the probability that i don't have any a's so what you have to do is just pick from the remaining 48 cards pick two cards and uh, divide it by 52 so, so all right i hope this is clear for everyone and uh, okay after solving this you will see that it's 1 over 33 now um, let's see the second problem similarly we uh, write it as both aces and uh, one ace of spades all right and uh, probability ace of spades Okay, proceeding as before. So how many aces do you have right now? So you know that one of the aces, which is the ace of spades is used and only you have to only pick one card. So you have three options and uh, for the remaining card and the first card has already been picked. So it's just three choose one into one divided by 52 choose two. Okay, so you're picking two cards. The first card, the number of ways you can pick the ace of spades is just one. And uh, after that, like you can pick uh, any of the remaining uh, aces left. So that's three choose one, which is three. And that will be the numerator, okay. And uh, similar to before, can someone tell me what is the probability of ace of spades? as a compliment. So the probability that we don't have any suspects. Yeah, so someone has already said the whole answer. Uh, so the answer turns out to be three out of uh, 51. And uh, there's an easier way to see that. So I'll come to that before doing this, uh, after doing this. So this is just 51 choose two divided by 52 choose two. All right. And uh, when you reduce this whole expression, you're going to get uh, three out of 51. And how do you see this? So you have to pick two cards and you know that one of them is already ace of spades. And uh, you know that uh, what you're going to do is uh, pick another ace from the remaining cards. So since one card is used up, you have 51 cards remaining. And for this, the second card you have three out of 51 options so the answer turns out to be three out of 51 without these uh solving this tedious calculation so that's uh another way to see the problem okay good answer so that's fine i guess now what is the point we are trying to emphasize here so when you look at it if you solve what is the three out of 51 it's one over 17. So 1 over 17 is a, has a greater probability, which is a, is a greater probability than 1 over 33. Right? So why is that happening? So the intuition is that what you're doing here in the first case is uh, when you only know that the probability uh, that you have both aces given that you have at least one ace. So the probability that we are calculating is actually the probability that you have both aces when you have at least one ace. So this at least one ace can be many aces. All right. And uh, that's, that does not improve our probability because you only know that it's one of these aces. You are not specific about, uh, so there is less specificity for the second card you're picking after the ace, like which ace you're picking. So you are not aware of which ace you're actually picking. You only know that you have one ace in your hand prior, okay? But for the second case, you have uh, some more information. So 
the the information that you have additionally is the fact that you have an an, an ace of spades which is a specific card and knowing that this card is something you already have in your hand gives you more information than just knowing that you have some ace and that's the reason why uh, this 1 over 17 comes and uh, the other case has a 1 over 33 which is smaller so the more information you have, the higher the probability is for this event, which you're looking at, which is the probability of both aces. Okay. Is the intuition clear for everyone? All right. So I hope I can proceed. Now, uh, what we're going to see now is a classic example where people confuse conditional probability. Okay. And uh, it's in the testing of a disease, which is sort of very relevant during these times. Okay. So what am I going to say here? So we, we have a disease, a disease, which uh, afflicts 1% of the population. So which affects 1% of the population. So this is sort of a sort of a rare disease, you can say. I mean, 1 over 100 is not rare, but I'm just saying that. And uh, test positive. Okay, so what I mean here is uh, the disease affects 1% of the population. So let's say we have 1000 people, it affects uh, 10 people. And uh, when you have the disease, you test positive. When you have the disease. So you say that you test uh, positive when you have the disease. And that's what we want, ideally. But we know that the uh, the tests are not always accurate, like 100% accurate. So suppose the test is advertised to be, say, 95% accurate. Okay. So what do I mean by this? 95% accurate means... Uh, Let's uh, define a few things. So let D denote the event that uh, patient has the disease. All right. And uh, let's uh, denote uh, using T that a uh, patient tests positive. Okay. So when I say, uh, the test is 95% accurate. What I mean is uh, the probability that the test tests positive, given that the patient has the disease, is 0 0.95. Also, the probability that the test turns out to be negative when uh, the patient does not have the disease is also 0.95. So what do we need from a test? We need it to be positive when the patient has uh, the disease and we need it to be negative when the patient does not. Okay. I'm just saying, so this is a definition of what is test positive. And uh, you know that this disease only affects 1% of the population. So what the patient cares about by uh, testing himself or herself is, uh, is just a probability that the test is uh, turns positive when you have the disease. This is what you actually, sorry. When you have the disease, you should know it from the test. Okay, this is very different from uh, T given D, which is this. Uh, this is different from this in the sense that uh, probability of T given D just 
tells you about the test but from a patient's perspective what you care about is whether you have you have the disease or not based on the test result so that is probability of d given t okay so is the setup clear for everyone are the notations clear okay sorry for that so if it's clear then uh, let's move to the solution of this probability that uh, given t is okay we are just using the base rule here so that will be just uh, this all right and uh, you can expand this so what are we expanding we are expanding the denominator which you can expand uh, based on the numerator as one term and can someone tell me what would be the second term so can someone tell me what the second term in the denominator would be yeah right so probability of uh, d complement and uh, probability of d complement all right <clears throat> so what all do you know so you know t given d which is 0.95 probability of the disease you know how because it only affects 1% of the population that is the probability of the disease whether you have the disease or not all right and you also know probability of t given d complement can someone tell me what is probability of t given d complement exactly 5% all right so 0 0.05 and uh, you know this probability which is 1% this is 99% and uh, similarly like you also know the numerator because you know this so when you substitute the values you will uh, get something like this as the answer Okay, let's understand what 0.16 here is. So when the probability that you have the disease, given that the test turns out to be positive is just 0.16, which is just 16%. So, I mean, it's not even 50%. It's, it's just around 20% when uh, you will have the disease when the test actually turns positive. This is not, you, this is not what you expect from a test. The test accuracy is 95%, but, but still the chances that you have a disease given that the test is positive is just 0.16. Please note the contrast here. That's, that's, that's what people confuse when uh, they don't understand probability well. So this is a very low probability and it's actually better to do a second test and you will have more evidence. So if the second test also turns out to be positive, then, then you can redo the calculation and update the probabilities. And then you can be more sure whether this, this result is actually true or not. So, I mean, even doctors uh, get this wrong and uh, note the fact, okay, can someone tell me why this probability is very low? You can look at the numbers and tell me which number is uh, the smallest here. So that, that would give you the intuition, but I don't want that. Uh, what I want to know is why is this uh, small intuitively? Exactly. 
exactly exactly the point here is that only 1% of the population gets affected which is a very small fraction of the population and uh, this 1% actually pulls down this 95% positive i mean uh, goodness of the test to something like 0.16 so if it was more like 50% then you will have uh, a good percentage of probability here but you don't have that it's only 1% so that's the reason why so yeah another way to actually see this is by the frequentist approach that we were talking in the last class so the frequentist intuition is as follows so say you the population is a uh, thousand people and you know that one person gets affected all right so these people will be test i mean the tests are designed so that you have less false positives so when you don't have the disease i mean sorry when you don't have the disease it can turn out to be positive as we have seen now but uh, tests are mostly designed so that when you have the disease they don't turn out to be negative i hope the, that is clear for everyone so do you guys understand the difference So you can have the disease and be tested uh, negative, which is something we don't want from the test. So this test, at least that we are talking about, so this one person gets affected and all these people are tested positive. So all the 10 who have the disease, are tested positive okay and uh, the remaining 990 do not i mean we do not have the disease right so we know that exactly 10 people have disease have the disease I mean, not exactly, but we are interpreting in a frequentist way. So out of 1000 people, we know that one person has, so 10 people have the disease roughly. And we know that 990 do not have the disease. All right. But due to the test being slightly erroneous, 5% of uh, 990 will test positive. So 95% accuracy for the test means exactly this. So approximately 50 people will be tested positive. Cool. So what you care about is the probability that you have uh, the disease uh, given the test turns out to be positive. So this by the frequentist approach is that uh, 10 people have the disease, but 50 people are said to have the disease, which means that they tested positive. So 10 people are really positive and 50 people are, I mean, the rest are having sort of false issues here. That's 10 over 50, which is uh, 0.2. So this is approximately close to uh, 0.16. And uh, so I made a small error by saying something here. Can uh, someone tell me what that was? So this calculation is right and whatever I've written down is right. But I said, I said something and uh, wrote something else. It's about the 50. Okay, think about it and uh, yeah, let me know later. Fine. So we have seen uh, another example where uh, probability actually is weird and non-intuitive. So I hope this example is uh, clear to everyone. So is the frequentist approach clear for everyone? Uh, 
okay okay and uh, is the method which uses the calculation clear for everyone i mean you will just have to plug out plug in the uh, numbers and you will get the answer so that's just knowing how to apply base rule okay is that fine can i proceed from this example okay cool so now uh, let's see common mistakes that happen when you apply conditional probability these are things that you guys should be noting common mistake so the first mistake uh, that happens very commonly is uh, confusing uh, probability of a given b with uh, the probability of b given a although it might sound silly but when you actually have to solve the problem you don't have a and b you have to define it yourself sometimes and uh, conditioning it on b versus conditioning it on a can lead to very different results and uh, i mean you guys know that these are different because of bayes rule at least and this is popularly known as the prosecutor's fallacy prosecutor's fallacy okay so there's a story behind this uh, i mean this is mostly because in olden days i mean i don't know now so there was a case of uh, a person named sally clark and uh, what happened is uh, she had two babies had two babies and uh, both these babies were murdered so and the mother was uh, convicted for the murders all right so what the court did is this the court assigned an expert to understand the probability that uh, this murder wouldn't have happened as in a mother killing uh, their baby so that's a very low probability right and uh, the expert said that uh, uh probability 1 over 8 500 that uh, the lady wouldn't have uh, murdered both the children so what i'm trying to say is uh, I'll make things clear in a second. I just write it down so that you guys can stare at it. So there are two children, and they argued as follows. okay try to uh, make sense of what i have written here so what we ideally need is uh, the probability that uh, you are innocent in a in a situation 
uh, as is happening in this case. So what you ne ideally need is to calculate the probability that you are innocent based on the evidence. And what the court actually ended up doing uh, is uh, looking at the evidence given that uh, uh, the person is guilty or the person is innocent. So what happened at the court was this. So you have evidence and the evidence uh, suggests that uh, both are not uh, murdered. I mean, both are murdered and assuming that the person is guilty versus, I mean, you don't know whether the person is innocent or guilty, but if you're supposing that the person is guilty and uh, then looking at the evidence, the expert said that uh, the chance of this happening is uh, one over 8,500. So the probability that I'm talking about one over 8,500 is uh, based on the fact, assuming the mother is guilty. Okay. So this is, uh, look at the base rule, in a sense, given evidence is what you need. And the probability of uh, evidence given into probability of innocence divided by the same factor plus the probability of evidence given guilty times the probability of uh, guilty. So here, uh, this 1, 000, 1 by 8,500 is uh, the probability of evidence given uh, guilty. That's what the expert actually uh, said to the court. So this is by looking at uh, the past cases and so on. So based on the evidence and uh, assuming that the person is guilty, he calculated this probability and uh, he said that there is only one in 8,500 chance that uh, this would have happened for one child. Then what they went ahead to do is since they have uh, two children were murdered and uh, this happened. So they assumed that uh, these two would be independent events like murdering both babies. And uh, that was the first uh, wrong assumption there. These are not entirely independent events, right? They are with the babies of the same mother. And uh, they assume that these events are independent and hence chose to multiply these probabilities. And uh, it turned out to be a very low probability, like one over 73 million, which I mean, this number is saying that the person is guilty, but it's, it's, it's not even a worthy calculation here. I mean, you're talking about something, you're doing something else. So, uh, is the implication clear for everyone? I'm not sure if I explained it properly, but uh, if you get the overall idea, then it's fine. I and mean, we are not uh, doing any calculations here. I'm just uh, trying to point out how things how things can go wrong. Please uh, stare at the screen for a while and. Uh, Tell me if you guys need more explanation. Yeah, sure. So uh, to uh, sort of summarize all of this, what I can try to say is this. So there was a lady who had uh, two babies and uh, she was convicted of the murder. And what the court went ahead to do is like assign an expert to actually evaluate the probability that the murder was actually done by the lady. So what he and what he uh, said to the court was uh, uh, based the probability that the evidence suggests that the person is uh, guilty, assuming that the person is guilty. So he looked at the evidence 
and uh, he calculated the probability that uh, the evidence suggests that the person is guilty conditioned on the fact that uh, she or he is uh, she is guilty here and then uh, said to the court that uh, with 1 over 8500 chance i mean the lady did the murder based on the evidence all right this is very different from, I mean, to, the basic fact is that the probability of innocence is very high. And uh, when you multiply probability of evidence given innocence with the probability of innocence here, this turns out to be a big number. So if this turns out to be a big number, then you have uh, this as a big number. So she is innocent. So she's innocent with a high chance. So just with probability, you can't decide what really happened. So the expert simply came up with the number. So that's that's one, I don't know, stupid thing to do. And after that, the court actually used it in a, a bad way by assuming that the, both the murders are independent. And then actually went ahead to say that there's only one in 73 million chance that uh, she's not guilty. Based on this calculation. Is it still confusing or? So just look at this. I mean, we are only interested in from a mathematical viewpoint. So what we have to care about is this, this whole expression. What we were given was this, and we assumed using this, we can actually calculate the final probability I'm just trying to point out the difference between this event and this event. So when you use this, uh, the lady was actually guilty. And this turns out to be actually proving that the lady is innocent because you are multiplying it by a number very close to one. And this also won't affect it too much. Is that clear now? All right. Yeah, this is just a story. This is not even important. All right. And uh, another confusion that I often see is just confusing the probability of A with the probability of A given B. So when you have conditioned or not, note that the probability of A given A is 1. Okay, so this is another confusion that I've seen. And uh, another one would be to confuse independence with the conditional independence. Okay, so I haven't defined what is conditional independence. So, I mean, as you guys can guess, so this would be just this. So, A, B, C are events. And I'm talking about A intersection B given uh, event C. So, I say these uh, events are conditionally, A and B are conditionally independent given C when uh, this happens. So, knowing that C happens, A and B are independent. That's what it means. And uh, this is very different from uh, the independence notion that we have uh, defined before. And uh, so let's let's elaborate on this point. Okay. So the first side uh, that I want everyone to note is that conditional independence does not imply independence. Okay, so think about this for a second and then I'll give you an example. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is based on knowing something, two events are independent versus you don't know anything has happened. And still, you can say that twin events are independent. 
okay an example would be in a game of chess you know that uh, when you know the strength of the opponent let's say both of you are strong and then the probability of winning you winning the game both i mean both a and b say a is the first game and b is the second game given the strength of the opponent so you guys are equally competent and uh, so winning the a is independent from winning the uh, game b because uh, both are strong players you don't know what is going to happen it depends on how the game progresses so in that case probability of winning a and b given the strength of the opponent is uh, can be i mean is, is conditionally independent so what you can say is uh, probability of winning a given strength times uh, probability of uh, winning b given strength all right so this is true in this example that we have constructed but here uh, not knowing the opponent strength actually matters a lot so what is probability of a and b here that's what we need to understand so in this case you don't know the strength of the opponent so when you play the first game you see that i mean say you have won the match so you, so you win it and then uh, see get to see what 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 is the other player like okay and when you play the second game you have more info about uh, the second player the player you are playing your opponent and uh, winning the match a does actually tell something whether you will win b or not all right so if he is a very strong opponent and then you get to realize that in a and you say border i mean somehow won the match like it was just border and uh, i mean there is a there is a higher chance that you will actually lose b because you realize that the opponent is very strong so what i'm trying to say is earlier games give evidence for how strong the opponent is all right and uh, this way you can see that although these events were uh, conditionally independent a and b were conditionally independent now but by just looking at a and b they are not independent because the result of a actually tells you something what is going to happen with b b is the event where you win the second match all right i hope this example is clear so this is showing why conditional independence does not imply independence all right okay so let's look at the uh, second way so i am trying to say what i'm trying to say here is uh, that independence does not imply conditional independence which may be hard to believe because independence sounds stronger without knowing the other person also it's the events are independent but it actually turns out that uh, independence does not imply conditional independence and uh, one example for this would be hmm, say you have a fire alarm and uh, the fire alarm goes off, goes off which means the fire alarm starts ringing and you know uh, that uh, say this is caused by either of these two events so when you actually have a fire or let's say someone is making popcorn and the smoke uh, detector like the popcorn burns and the smoke de de detector sends a smoke so uh, it turns the i mean the fire alarm goes off after that all right so what i'm trying to say here is the situation where you have a fire alarm and the fire alarm only goes off in two cases either when you have a fire or when someone else is smoke uh, making popcorn and then it goes bad so i mean you can easily assume that the probability of uh, fire and uh, the 
probability of popcorn i mean sorry the events for fire and uh, making popcorn are independent because a fire can happen i mean independent of someone making popcorn i hope that's believable so suppose f and uh, p are independent okay but based on this example you can see that the probability that there is a fire given the alarm goes off and no one is making popcorn is one okay try to digest this fact so you have a, a fire alarm and it goes off and so that is a a is the even the alarm goes off and you know that no one is making popcorn so if the alarm goes off and no one is making popcorn then you know that uh, there is fire and that's that is the reason why the probability is one here because initially i mentioned that a, only these two events can trigger the fire alarm so when you know that uh, no one is making popcorn then you definitely know that uh, the fire i mean fire is the cause of the fire alarm so uh, what 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 have we understood here so these are uh, events which are independent f and p are defined to be independent okay but conditioned on the fact that the alarm goes off they are not independent because uh, c or i mean the popcorn uh, someone making the popcorn or not gives you complete information whether there was fire or not conditioned on the fact that the alarm went off but not conditionally independent okay so these are uh, two things that uh, you guys should understand very clearly conditional independence does not imply independence and independence also does not imply conditional independence and we have seen counter examples as to why this is the case so are these two examples clear for everyone all right now i'll uh, try to introduce you to a problem and we'll continue with this problem the next class so uh, this problem is known as the monty hall problem and many of you might already have seen this and uh, the setup is as follows you have three doors and uh, you have two goats behind uh, two of those doors and uh, one car behind uh, one of the doors and uh, monty is a person who actually conducted the show where uh, someone from the audience uh, comes up to the stage and uh, what happens is you get to pick one of these doors you don't know i mean the person who comes from the audience does not know which door has the car i mean you don't i mean i am assuming that you want the car and not the goats if you want the goats then it's a different problem so i am assuming you want the cars so you want uh, the car okay and uh, also monty who conducts the show knows that uh, knows which door the i mean the which Car, I mean, which door is behind? Sorry, which car is behind the door? And also, which door the car is behind? So Monty knows complete info about the car and which door it is behind. All right. So what we can assume here is, say, you have three doors. So one, two, and three. and uh, without uh, loss of generality we can assume that uh, uh, the audience the per the person who comes from the audience picks door 1 and we can do this uh, because i mean he can pick door 2 or door 3 so based on what he picks we can just rename uh, renumber these doors 
and we can always uh, assign numbers in such a way that he always picks the first door. So whatever door he picks, say he picks the left door, we start numbering from left to right. So that will be one, two, three, and so on. So we can always make sure the guy from the audience picks the door one here. I'm not saying left door is the first door. I mean, if you pick some other door, we'll just uh, rename it as door one and then proceed with the analysis. Okay. And uh, fix door one. This is because of symmetry here. And we, we can always do it. Fine. Now, what Monty does in response to uh, this person picking uh, door one is that he opens door two or three. are opened. And uh, since Monty knows where the car is, Monty only opens the door, which does not have the car. Okay. Now the question is, so you have picked door one and Monty say opens uh, door two and shows you that there is a, a goat behind it. So Monty would not open a car, I mean, a door which has a car behind it because that would be just a dumb game because then you can just choose that car and then you would win. So Monty only opens, uh, opens a door which does not have a car behind it. And he does not open one again for you because we have picked one. So Monty, Monty only opened one of two or three. And you don't know upfront which of these have, have the car behind it. So the question is, is it beneficial? To switch. So what I mean by switch here is to start with you pick door number one, whatever the door is like, that's the numbering I'm saying. So you pick door one and door two or three is uh, opened based on which has the car. And now you have an option, like say, assume you are in the audience right now. So you have an option to switch your choice. So from one to three, if two is opened. So the question is whether it's beneficial to switch or not. And note uh, that the car can be behind any of these three with equal probability to start with. So car is in one, two, three with equal probability to start with. So what I mean to say here is there's a one over three chance that it's behind door one, one over three chance behind door two and one over three chance behind door three. The question is, uh, is it beneficial to switch from uh, picking one? That's the question. So is the question clear for everyone? All right. And do note that whatever assumptions we have made by saying, say the car is behind these doors with equal probability or say, okay, consider this case, you choose a uh, door one and uh, the car happens to be behind door one. All right. So Monty has a choice of either opening two or three. And in that case, Monty opens. So if one has car, Monty opens two or three with equal probability. So this is part of the setup and this is a very crucial assumption. Okay. Someone has uh, raised their hand. You can unmute yourself and go ahead. If you have a doubt. Uh, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay. 
Okay, I think that was accidental. So uh, in that case, uh, is the problem clear for everyone? I don't think we have the time to proceed with the analysis, but uh, this is a very famous problem and uh, you guys can read about it. So what we'll be doing in the next class is analyzing whether it's actually beneficial to switch or not. So I hope uh, the setup is clear for everyone. This problem has many variations, but uh, this is the most classic one. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, can you people guess with a binary answer? Okay, it's beneficial to switch or not. Fine. So people are saying it's beneficial to switch. Okay. Can I see more answers? Okay, can someone uh, tell me why it's beneficial to switch in that case? Then I wouldn't have to go through the analysis. Equal probability. Okay, that's a good answer. So you wouldn't switch is what uh, Anusha is saying? Okay, the explanation is not clear. I mean, so if you switch, what happens? I mean, why would you switch is the first question that you guys have to answer. The second question is what happens? I mean, right, that becomes two by three. That's right. Yeah, so the answer is to actually switch. And uh, we will see how the probability becomes two by three. Can uh, you tell me, I mean, Satvik, can you tell me like why it becomes two by three? It's okay, I mean, I'm not putting you in pressure. If you know the answer, you can just say it. I, I mean, even if you know the answer and you don't say it, it's fine, we'll see it in the next class. So that's perfectly fine. So this actually requires some thought and like many people have actually gone wrong with this problem again. So there was a lady, Marilyn was Savan. So she was thought to be, uh, one of the smartest people alive at some point. And uh, she wrote a uh, newspaper column in New York Times or something like that, that it's beneficial to switch. And people like even with PhDs in mathematics, like wrote to her saying that uh, her answer is wrong and then she, that she's stupid and she doesn't know what she's talking about and all that. But finally it turns out what uh, Marilyn said was uh, the right way to look at it. And uh, yeah yeah my question was like why is the chance better when you are given another choice so i mean i can actually modify this problem in ways where your i mean where the answer is not switching oh no 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 that's not the intuition mm. There's a, I mean, it's it's not that straightforward. Yeah, but yeah, you got the answer. It requires some form of uh, analysis. I mean, uh, it's not very straightforward and that's why people got it wrong. But the answer is to switch. That's, that's good intuition actually. I mean, it's very hard to have such sort of an intuition. And one intuitive reason why you guys should switch is uh, can be stated as follows. So I'll just take one more minute and I'm not gonna write anything down. So assume that you were given a million doors. So you have a million doors and you pick one of those doors thinking that like you have a car behind it. All right. So when uh, the, when Monty op opens like another door from the rest. So let's say there are like thousand doors and then uh, 
from uh, he opens one door from those remaining 999 doors so what you get to pick is from 998 doors and the chance that one of these 998 doors have uh, the car behind it is, is is close to 998 by 1000 which is a huge number i mean a huge number as in like it's close to one so i mean just from this example you can see that uh, switching is beneficial because if you switch you are going to a place where there is 998 over 1000 probability like one of those doors will have uh, the car with a high probability but you don't get to see this intuition when you have only three doors. So if you just simulate this for n doors, like you'll get to see that whenever you switch, you are landing up in a better probability. Like you have better chances of having the car. So I'm not saying like whatever you choose is gonna result in a car. Because even one of those doors, when you pick, there are so many other doors that like you don't know which which one would be the right one. At least here, you only have two options. So when Monty opens two, you only have one or three to choose from. But when you have a million doors, I mean, you have almost every door left. So you, only one door has been chosen by you. And I mean, it's almost sure that like the car would be behind one of the other doors. That's all I'm trying to say. So switching is always beneficial in that case. We'll also, I mean, we'll prove that uh, it's actually beneficial to switch even in this case but uh, a good way to think about or develop intuition about such problems is to like look at the extreme cases i mean if you remember from the last class i had suggested to solve problems in probability you can think about extreme cases and simple cases so developing that sort of a thinking is very important when you when you want to solve new problems at least you will know the answer up front and then you can work towards that so yeah i, I took more time i'm sorry but uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, the link for the drive, which has been uploaded in the classroom. So, uh, Anusha, do you want uh, the link to the notes? Is that what you're asking for? I'm not sure if I uploaded the last class notes. Is that what you're saying? Oh, I see. Okay, okay. I'll 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 upload both these notes uh, today, right after the class. If you guys have, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I know, I know. I'll upload both. I forgot. I'm sorry. I'll upload uh, notes from both these classes. Yeah. Yeah, so. So. Yeah, so I'm, I'm putting a link which uh, directs you to like the Sally Clark's case where she was falsely accused of murder of her kids. So, yeah. Is uh, Jasma ma'am here? Yes, I think ah, that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, uh, today's class is, uh, we are winding up? Yes, ma'am, it's over. Yeah, it's done. Okay. So I'll just take a quick attendance. Sure. Uh, thank you, sir. So just say uh, uh, good morning yesterday's uh, code to mark your attendance. Anand sir, so today there was no test conducted, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm planning to just do it randomly. Okay, okay. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. So 
I think this will be a common link, sir. The uh, Zoom link that we have got, it is reserved for probability classes. Okay, ma'am. So I can just reuse the same link that uh, I'm using right now. Yes, sir. Sure, ma'am. Yes, sure, sure. Thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, children. And we'll uh, carry on, sir. Thank you so much. Thank Have you, a nice day. Yeah, you too, ma'am. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. 